This is Arun Amar, and I'll be discussing the evaluation and treatment of patients with acute ischemic stroke. This image comes courtesy of one of my mentors, Dr. Zlokovic, who injected latex into the arteries of the brain and then dissolved the substance of the brain to reveal this cast of all the blood vessels that are left behind. The brain weighs only 2% of the body, but receives 20% of blood flow. And the total length of the capillaries, if summated together, is more than 400 miles. It's therefore easy to understand with such a robust vasculature and the need for blood flow that stroke is the second leading cause of death worldwide, the number one cause of disability in the United States, with over 900,000 new strokes per year, or one every 40 seconds. Stroke affects four out of five households with a direct cost of more than $300 billion, and that does not factor in the additional costs due to lost productivity. Stroke can be broadly classified into two groups. The more common of them is ischemic stroke due to a blockage of blood flow, which accounts for about 80 to 85 percent. And of those, the various causes include atherosclerosis of a large artery that causes in situ clotting or thrombosis. Another potential mechanism is a clot that forms in the heart and then travels distally to the brain, what we call embolization. There can also be intrinsic damage and disease of the small blood vessels of the brain, leading to particular types of strokes that we call lacunar, and they tend to occur in characteristic regions of the brain like the basal ganglia and the cerebellum. And in about one quarter of strokes, we can't identify the underlying cause. The remainder of strokes are hemorrhagic. This consists of bleeding in the brain, either into the substance of the brain, which we call intracerebral, or into the space surrounding the brain, which is subarachnoid hemorrhage, typically from a ruptured brain aneurysm. Our conceptual approach to a patient with acute ischemic stroke is always the same. We want to know three things. First is the vessel status. Which artery is occluded and to what extent is it occluded? Next is the status of the tissue. And we'll distinguish ischemic tissue, which has insufficient blood flow but still is potentially salvageable and functional versus infarction, which is permanently damaged tissue. Lastly, we want to know the perfusion status by quantifying and measuring various parameters of blood flow. The premise of acute ischemic stroke treatment is that there is a central core region of permanently damaged tissue depicted here in red. This is the area of infarction where there has been a critical reduction of blood flow or oligemia that leads to complete bioenergetic failure and death of the tissue. This region is surrounded by a larger area of ischemic tissue depicted here in green. In this region, the degree of decreased blood flow is enough to cause dysfunction of the brain, but the tissue is still salvageable, and if the flow can be restored, the tissue can be saved and those impairments or deficits can be reversed. The difference between these two areas is what we call the ischemic penumbra. We know that with time, if the vessel remains occluded, the area of the infarct expands and grows, whereas the area of salvageable penumbra decreases. But this ischemic progression is highly variable from patient to patient. Some patients can have salvageable penumbra even beyond six hours since the onset of their stroke symptoms. And the neurologic exam cannot reliably distinguish between the tissues that's already permanently damaged or the infarct versus the ischemic territory that's at risk of converting to infarct later on. However, advanced imaging tools, such as the ones I'll discuss later, can help identify this mismatch and in appropriate patients, Reperfusion therapy to open up the vessel can help restore lost neurological function if such mismatch is present. This principle is illustrated in the next two slides. So all of these lines on this chart represent different patients who had the same uh, type of occlusion, uh, a thrombus or blockage in the proximal segment of the middle cerebral artery. And these patients were then imaged at various time intervals and the degree of permanent infarct depicted as uh, the regions of pink on the accompanying MRI scan is measured 
uh, quantitatively. So for instance, this patient uh, here depicted with the blue line has a relatively small volume of stroke even more than 10 hours since the onset of symptoms. Conversely, this patient here depicted by the red line has a very large volume of stroke after just three hours since the onset of symptoms. We know that reperfusion matters, and in a large meta-analysis of thousands of patients across more than 50 studies, the odds ratio of a good outcome after three months was 4.43 for those who achieved recanalization versus those that had persistent occlusion of the vessel. We also know that the benefit is directly related to the speed of recanalization. For every 30 minute delay between the onset of symptoms and the time that the tissue is reperfused, there's a 10% decrease in the probability of a good functional outcome measured by the modified Rankin score or MRS. So our mantra is time is brain. And to just put that into numbers, in a typical acute ischemic stroke, every minute the brain loses nearly 2 million neurons, 14 billion synapses, or the connections between neurons, and more than 7.5 miles of myelinated fibers. There are principally two methods of recanalization. One is to administer an intravenous drug that breaks up the clot. Um, in the United States, we typically use tissue plasminogen activator, or TPA, and the window for giving that medicine is up to 4.4, uh, excuse me, 4.5 hours after the onset of the stroke. Uh, but there's another drug that's another thrombolytic agent that's gaining more and more popularity called tenecteplase. Alternatively, or sometimes in conjunction with an intravenous agent, we can perform mechanical thrombectomy. This is a surgical procedure that involves navigating a tube called a catheter from an artery in the leg or the wrist and using it to extract the clot that's blocking a blood vessel in the brain. The window of opportunity for performing this procedure is up to eight or more hours after the onset of stroke symptoms. This is an animation of how that procedure is performed. Uh, in this case, the patient has a thrombus or a blood clot that's occluding a large artery in the brain. And through access, either in the femoral artery of the groin or sometimes in the wrist, we can steer a catheter through the body. Now, all the arteries in the body are connected. So under x-ray guidance, once we've entered into one of them, we can steer this tube or catheter into the brain and use it to deliver a system that will extract the uh, thrombus. In this case, it's a catheter that's used to uh, connect to a suction device to engulf the clot and aspirate it out of the, the brain. In the process, it restores blood flow to the brain, and if performed in a timely fashion, can completely resolve the patient's symptoms. After removing the clot, the catheter is removed from the body. There's an alternative device called a stent retriever, which is an expandable metal cylindrical cage that can engage with the clot and use it to uh, pull out the clot. And that technique is depicted in the following uh, video. In this case, very similar to what was depicted in the prior animation, the catheter is advanced up to the uh, occlusive clot. And then the stent retriever device is placed within the center of it. When it's delivered, it's compressed into the microcatheter. But as it's released from that microcatheter, its intrinsic self-expanding radial force causes it to engage with the clot. This produces an instantaneous channel of flow, and then subsequently, the whole clot with the stent retriever can be removed from the body. This is an example of the type of clot that can be retrieved with such a device. So I mentioned the three data elements that we want to assess in every patient with acute ischemic stroke. And I'll focus now particularly on perfusion. Perfusion measures blood flow to the brain. And although it correlates with the vessel status, it also depends on collateral blood flow from other sources, 
It depends on blood pressure, the time that's elapsed, and, and many other factors. So there are four different perfusion imaging parameters, including cerebral blood flow, or CBF. This is the volume of blood flow through a given volume of tissue per unit time. And it's typically about 50 to 60 milliliters per 100 grams of tissue per minute. Electrochemical dysfunction occurs when that is reduced to about 20 to 30 milliliters. And cell death occurs when it's below 12 milliliters per 100 grams per minute. Cerebral blood volume is the total volume of blood in a given volume of tissue, and it's been shown to be reduced in tissue that's permanently damaged or infarcted. The mean transit time is the average transit time of blood passing through a given brain region measured in seconds. And the time to peak is the time to which the maximum contrast signal arrives in a given brain region after it's injected intravenously also measured in seconds. At USC, we were relatively early adopters of a software platform called Rapid. This provides a fully automated, operator-independent uh, way to post-process data from CT and MRI scans. It generates two maps. One is in pink and one is in green. The pink map represents an area of core infarction, which has been proven to correlate with regions of the brain where the cerebral blood flow is less than 30% of that on the opposite side. The green map represents an area of critical hypoperfusion where there is a delay of the arrival of blood uh, measured uh, with the contrast of more than six seconds. And this software can quantitatively calculate the relative volumes and the degree of mismatch between them or in other words, help figure out what is the ischemic penumbra. The processing time for this is less than two minutes and it can facilitate clinical decision making, such as I'll illustrate in the next few slides. So these parameters are not just arbitrary. Uh, there have been studies that validate them using receiver operating characteristic curves to establish those thresholds that I mentioned. It was shown that the tissue depicted in the pink map, where there is less than 30% of flow of the opposite side, or more than a 70% reduction in cerebral blood flow, accurately predicts the volume of infarct as shown by a subsequent MRI scan on a particular series called DWI, or diffusion weighted imaging, for patients who do achieve timely reperfusion. Conversely, that tissue at risk depicted in the pink map, where there's a T max of six seconds or more, accurately predicts what's going to happen and the degree of final stroke volume um, if the vessel does not get opened and there is no reperfusion. So here's an example of a patient who's an ideal candidate for recanalization. On the left side of the screen is the map of core infarction, which in this case is zero milliliters of tissue, whereas on the right side of the screen is the volume of tissue that's vulnerable or at risk depicted in green. The ratio between these is infinite because the denominator is zero. Here's an example of a patient with some core infarction but still a significant mismatch and would be a good candidate for recanalization. On the left is the pink map demonstrating about 42 milliliters of infarction but there's 98 milliliters of tissue at risk for a ratio, excuse me, there's 140 milliliters of tissue at risk with a mismatch ratio of 3.3. This is an example of a patient uh, who would not be a good candidate for recanalization because the area of decreased blood flow in green and the decreased uh, infarction in pink is nearly identical. So we can use this rapid software to uh, extend the treatment window for patients who have salvageable tissue. And it's particularly useful when the onset is greater than six hours um, since the time of their presentation. In some studies, there has been uh, benefit when patients selected using this type of imaging software can be treated even up to 24 hours since the onset of their symptoms.
It can also be used to avoid administrating futile or harmful reperfusion therapies in patients who already have established large infarctions. And it can be used to facilitate transfer and triage decisions. For instance, a uh, hospital in the community that may not have availability of those endovascular procedures that I described using the catheters to remove the clot can make decisions about whether it's worth transferring such a patient to a center like USC where those surgeries can be performed. Lastly, for the medical students and residents in the audience, I just want to remind them that stroke is a neurosurgical disease and I encourage their interest in the research and treatment of this condition. Thank you very much.